Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In the dialogue, The Phaedo, there's a brief discussion of two of the virtues, actually in conjunction with two of the other virtues. And Socrates is going to distinguish between our ordinary way of looking at courage and temperance and the philosophical way of doing so. He'll actually go so far as to say that it's only the philosophers who genuinely are courageous or temperate. And we'll see why in just a moment. Before that, though, let's think about what it means in very broad senses to, to talk about a person as having courage or exhibiting courage and having temperance or moderation is often how we would put it, control, self-control, um, what do we mean when we say those terms? Often we'll talk about courage as involving doing something even though you're afraid. We, you know, we've got these truisms, the courageous person, the brave person, it's not that they're not afraid at all, it's that they overcome their fear. These are the sorts of things that we say in our culture and that's what they said in, in Greek culture uh, around the time of Plato as well. So it involves acting. And the action could be um, standing fast, you know, not necessarily going somewhere and doing something, but staying where, where you are, acting despite one's fears. Going out and, and doing something in the face of that which could be terrifying, that which could be worrisome. Um, courage could involve the battlefield. It could involve going to talk to some girl you know, when you're feeling kind of shy, I remember when I was in, uh, uh, in ninth grade entering high school, it was a big thing to call a girl on the phone. And, and I think for many people nowadays, that wouldn't be anything at all. But then, you know, by the time that I was a junior, I was an old hand at this sort of thing. But there were other things that I was uh, afraid of as well. And it, it took doing, you know, things to, to overcome that, that trepidation that I had. Um, so courage, we've got an ordinary common sense notion of it. It's not the same thing as like not having any fear, always, you know, jumping into danger. That's, that's a little bit too far. But it's not cowardice. Cowardice is when you, you don't stand up to fears and you let your fears master you and dominate you. What about temperance? So phorosune in, in Greek, uh, which we can translate as moderation or self-control. It's understood as being control over one's desires for physical pleasures. So for eating, for drinking, for intoxication, for comfort, for sex. Um, these are the sorts of things that, that comprise temperance. I think that we could, you know, in Plato's world, um, we could probably, if we were to bring him up to date, we could probably say, you know, watching TV all day, that would be an example of intemperance or a lack of self-control. Um, that could that could fit in there as well, you know, loving spectacles, loving things for the eyes. So we have a, a, a commonsensical understanding of these. And notice that I put um, that these involve not just a pattern of action. If we say that somebody's courageous, we can count on them to act in a certain way consistently. There's a pattern to their their behavior. There's a there's a structure. There's a kind of schema there of how they're going to react. It also involves having the right kind of desires or, or uh, desi desire or desires, I put here. Um, but it also involves, at least for Plato, some kind of knowledge or reasoning process. Now, that's an addition on Plato's part that isn't necessarily there in other people's conception of virtue. But that's going to be very important for Plato, as we're going to see. So, if we think about it in terms of a reasoning process, we can ask 
why is a person courageous or why is a person temperate? What is the structure of their motivation? And that's a matter partly of desires, that's a matter partly of, of reasoning. So the affective and the cognitive come together in that respect. Now, why are most people courageous? What is it that they want? What's the thing that they are actually trying to, to, to attain or to avoid? What's at risk? What's at play? What's the value that's at stake in acting courageously? Well, if somebody behaves courageously on the battlefield, if they think that death is a bad thing, and most people do think that death is a bad thing, why are they risking death? You know, we could come up with a couple candidates. Could be to, you know, protect others. I'm going to go to war because my homeland is being threatened. I don't want my wife and children to be at risk of, you know, ancient Greek warfare is pretty brutal. Sometimes conquered cities, the wife would become a, a slave, uh, little babies would be killed. I mean, read, read the Iliad, you know. Um, children would become slaves as well. Who knows what would happen to them? So, you know, there's, there's the need to protect others. We could say the same thing about those who engage in, in protection, uh, you know, more locally against criminals, against um, fire, against, you know, disasters. But what else? Why, why else is a person risking um, their life? Well, it could be in order to get something out of it. A thief can be kind of courageous. They're daring. Why? Because they want to they wanna make some money. They want to get some resources. Could be, you know, pursuing physical pleasure as well. Um, the one that Plato focuses on the most, fear of dishonor. You know, there, this is not Athens, but the same sort of mentality was, was quite prevalent in Athens. Um, a Spartan mother told her son, come home with your shield or on your shield, meaning being born dead on your shield uh, as, as sort of the stretcher that they would carry you along with. Don't throw away your shield, which is what you would do if you had to run away, right? Because you have this big heavy thing that's weighing you down. Come home with your shield because you stood fast and fought at the battle, or on your shield dead as somebody who wasn't dishonored. Now, Plato says this is not really genuine courage. As a matter of fact, it's courage in a way but it's also cowardice in a way. So courage, the way that most people have it, the way that most people exhibit it when they do have it or exhibit it, is really a mixture of itself and its opposite, courage and cowardice. Now how can that be? Well, they stand up against fear because they have other fears that they're more concerned with. And he doesn't worry so much about protecting others. That could be an interesting counterexample to this. But he says, if you're afraid of being dishonored, if you're afraid of what other people are going to say, so you're out there, even though you're scared of, of dying, the philosopher actually isn't afraid of dying because he, does, he understands death is not a bad thing. But if you're like an ordinary person, you're out there afraid of dying, afraid of the pain that's going to happen when somebody shoves a spear through you or hacks you with an axe and leaves you for dead as you bleed out. Um, and you're willing to take that risk because you're even more afraid of what they're going to say if you come home without your shield. You're a coward. You're just a courageous coward. You're a mix, an interesting mix. The philosopher, he says, is going to exhibit courage, but not because he's worried about, you know, gain or honor or, or those sorts of things. What about temperance, self-control? You know, it, it's probably a good thing if we don't eat more than we ought to or we don't, you know, seek out super rich foods. We live in an environment today where um, there's all sorts of dangers lurking. And that's why we, so many of us are obese, you know, in Western society. Uh, and it's actually starting to hit the third world. As the third world becomes more prosperous, many of them become obese because the foodstuffs that we have are super tasty, super abundant, calorie-rich, fat-rich, even the, the, the fat-free things are probably not 
particularly good for you because they bring about you know other issues as well. Temperance would mean not going to the buffet because what happens when you go to the buffet? Well, you want to eat more, right? It would also mean um, saying no to seconds. It would mean keeping portion size to a reasonable amount. It would mean probably eating tasty food, but not going nuts about it where you need to squander a lot of money on exotic ingredients or, you know, the absolutely freshest things flown in from Peru. We could say the same thing for all sorts of other bodily pleasures as well, you know. Do you need, I don't know how, how, how high... Uh, thread count can go, but let's say, that, I don't know, maybe there's a thousand thread count sheets. Do you really need that? Or is the, the cheap sheets pretty much about the same level? I, I've actually, you know, I remember the first time I actually slept on good sheets. First time in my life, because I, you know, I was staying with somebody who cared about that sort of thing. And it did feel nice. There was a difference. But that's not the sort of difference that your, your life should revolve around. You got to keep these things in, in check. You got to keep in, in moderation. Uh, the, the ancient Greeks thought nothing too much. Um, what else? Sex. We can talk about that. We can talk about um, taking you know intoxicants. You shouldn't drink too much alcohol. Shouldn't drink too much coffee. If you're a coffee uh, addict like I am, I am actually in the process of cutting back from two pots a day to one pot a day. That's rough going, because I'm not particularly temperate. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Why do people exhibit temperance? What's the reason? What is it that they're trying to get out of that? Is it that they do it because that's the thing to do, and it's just a good thing in and of itself? That's not the reason why most people are temperate or moderate. It's so that they can enjoy other So, you know, I should uh, subject my body to exercise and, you know, pay attention to my diet so I can be healthy, so I can live longer and enjoy more pleasures. Or I should do that, you know, and I should work out. Here's a great example. When I was uh, in, in my senior year of high school, and then for a little bit after that, I used to do some pretty extensive endurance, you know, lifting workouts. And I would do that for anywhere from like, you know, two to three hours a day most days. And I would go to the Y because the Y was where the serious lifters went. I knew guys who would go to the Y, they would do their real workout, and then they would go to one of the other health clubs. Back then it was Vic Tanny was the big one. And what would they do there? Pick up women. Um, they wouldn't actually do a real workout there. They'd like pretend to work out. It, why were they doing all of this, you know, painful activity? So they could, you know, get dates. So they could so they could enjoy other pleasures, intimacy, you know, sex, all those, those sorts of things. So Socrates is saying that if you're giving up pleasures, if you're being moderate just so that you can enjoy other pleasures, similarly with courage, there's actually some intemperance. There's a lack of self-control to your self-control. It's not pure. It's mixed. It's being done for the sake of its opposite. Only the philosopher is truly temperate. Now, I'm going to erase some of this stuff here and put in Socrates at his own answer about this. He says... What actually calls the shots in these cases? Wisdom. Now, wisdom is another one of the virtues for Socrates. And so you have one virtue that sort of is the architectonic virtue for the others. He says that um, when it comes down to it, here we go, there's only one currency for which um, all these tokens of ours should be in... in, in and exchanged, and that is wisdom. In fact, it's wisdom that makes possible courage and self-control. And he goes on further and says, and it also makes justice, or in a word, true goodness. And the presence or absence of pleasures or fears or other such feelings makes no difference at all. Whereas morality that's based on emotional values is a mere illusion. A thoroughly common conception, which has nothing sound in it and nothing true. 
The true moral ideal, whether self-control or justice or courage, the real thing, is a sort of purification. A purgation from these emotions. Wisdom is itself a purification that's, that's required for that. So, what does wisdom consist in? Being freed from concern with pleasures, pains, emotions in general, and desiring the good solely for the sake of the good. A different kind of desire. Desiring to be a courageous person, that is a person whose response to danger and to fearful things is actually guided by wisdom, guided by knowledge of what truly is fearful and what isn't really fearful, uh, what the point of, of genuine action and, and courage is. Uh, likewise for temperance, temperance is really governed by, for, for the philosopher, wisdom. Otherwise, it's really intemperance disguised as temperance, and you may in fact be able to develop a habit of resisting alcohol or cigarettes or sex, but you're doing it just for the sake of something else with respect to which you're not self-controlled, with respect to which you're intemperate. So this is what Socrates says wisdom, not wisdom, courage and temperance really are in themselves, the, the true forms of them. Not the, not the stuff that we see in ourselves, not the stuff that the common conception has. So only the philosopher truly has these virtues.